Welcome to the Homesteaders of America podcast, where we encourage simple living, hard work, natural health care, real food, and building an agrarian society. If you're pioneering your way through modern noise and conveniences, and you're an advocate for living a more sustainable and quiet life, this podcast is for you. Welcome to this week's podcast. I'm your host, Amy Fuel, and I'm the founder of the Homesteaders of America organization and annual events. If you're not familiar with us, we are a resource for homesteading education and online support, and we even host a couple of in-person events each year, with our biggest annual event happening right outside the nation's capital here in Virginia every October. Check us out online at homesteadersofamerica.com. Follow us on all of our social media platforms and subscribe to our newsletter so that you can be the first to know about all things HOA. That's short for Homesteaders of America. Don't forget that we have an online membership that gives you access to thousands, yes, literally thousands of hours worth of information and videos. It also gets you discount codes, an HOA decal sticker when you sign up, and access to event tickets before anyone else. All right, let's dive into this week's episode. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Homesteaders of America podcast. This week, I have my friend Janet Garman. Thanks for joining us, Janet. I'm so glad to be here. So a lot of times I say my friend when we have guests and they really are my friends, but Janet is like my really real friend. (laughs) (laughs) We talk all the time. And for those of you who don't know, she's also our HOA vendor coordinator. So we know Janet pretty well here at HOA. So Janet, why don't you tell us a little about about yourself for those who might not know who you are? Oh, sure thing. So we are in Maryland. We currently are running our farm as a uh, sheep farm. It also has chickens and some leftover animals from when we had uh, still had our children growing up here. So just note to parents, some of those animals don't go with them when they get married and move out. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But we are raising uh, 15 sheep for wool currently and lots of chickens for eggs. And we have a big vegetable garden and we are technically, I suppose, uh, retired people, but we're not because we have too many businesses. So we can't retire ever. So yeah. Yeah. But you're living the good life up there in Maryland and having fun. And so this today, we're going to specifically talk about wool sheep, but let's talk a second. You have a a few books out. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Hmm. Well, thanks. Um, I do. One of my favorite books that I wrote is called keeping sheep and other fiber animals. And it takes you from what animals are right for you, all the way through your decision making, your infrastructure setup, how to work with wool, all the way through using a mill or doing it yourself and getting things set up on your property or sending it out to a small cottage mill to help have help getting it processed into the product that you want. I love that book. It has a lot of interviews in it with people that are in the industry. Uh, I just enjoyed it so much, uh, writing it, sharing what I had learned over 20 years of raising fiber animals. And so that's one. I also have a two book set that can be purchased separately, 50 DIY projects for keeping chickens and 50 DIY projects for keeping goats. And I have a natural dye guidelines no, workbook. Um, it's called uh, uh, Natural Dyes on Wool with Timber Creek Farm. I do specialize in working with wool, which is probably a no-brainer for everyone to understand why. And natural dyes are my passion. I just love it. You can just go out in your yard and find something that can be turned into permanent color um, on protein fibers. So that's near and dear to my heart. I also have a children's book called uh, Margarita and the uh, Beautiful Gifts that was inspired by something that happened here on our farm. You also have a publishing company too, right? We do. Yes. My daughter and I are running Sawdust Publishing and it is geared to homesteaders and small farmers who have a voice in the community that would like to share some unique method or subject that is near and dear to their heart. We're also doing children's books that are tales that originate from a farm type or homestead type setting. We're really excited about it. We will definitely have two books out this year, maybe three. And um, they're all in the works currently. And we have a couple more people in the contract phase right now signing their books up with us. So it's really exciting. We are trying to bridge the gap between the big publishing houses that tend to not always notice the smaller voices and 
the do-it-yourself method of um, publishing a book. So we're kind of in between. We have a full staff of designers, editors, proofreaders, and we are going to be, you know, producing a product that they can be proud to hold in their hands. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it because, you know, um, one of the things that we have tried to focus, start focusing on with HOA at our event is trying to get more speakers that are not as well known, but they have equally as valuable information and maybe even more valuable in a lot of ways because they're living a different life than some of these other big names. And so I love that you're doing that. So, all right, so let's yeah. jump in to okay. wool sheep. Okay. Yeah. So why don't you tell us, so, you know, I have wool sheep. So, and all these sheep episodes that we're recording for HOA, I am always and forever going to say, yes, we just got sheep and I'm going to ask questions that I have specifically for my sheep as well. <laughs> but <laughs> why don't we start with like, what, what are the main kinds of wool sheep that people might get into. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of people choose um, merinos, Shetlands. We have Finn, which is a, a very popular homestead breed. The Icelandics are a good dual purpose breed. So that's just a few that people tend to gravitate for in the lifestyle that we're in, Amy. There's, there's hundreds of sheep breeds. Uh, sheep are ancient animals Mm -hmm. um, on this earth and so if you go to a different country you're going to find a whole lot of different breeds that are kept for wool than we you know never heard of here the fleece and fiber source book that was put out by uh, deb robson and carol acarius uh, many years ago is like the go-to source book for breeds and their fiber So if you're looking for a particular kind of fiber for the art that you want to do, that is a great book to have on hand so that you're not ending up with a barely coarse rug fiber when you had hoped to be making sweaters for your whole family. So, you know, you need to know, I think what I always tell people when they're looking for fiber animals is what is your end product? What do you want to do with the fiber from your animals? Or what niche market are you trying to sell to? Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to be a rug yarn creator and developer, that's fine, but you're not going to want to do that with a fine merino sheep. So those are the the things that you need to think about. So what are some examples? Like if somebody did want to get um, a fiber that is softer, uh, could Mm -hmm. you give us maybe two examples of that? And then what are some examples of a coarser fibered sheep? Mm -hmm. So Romney's are kind of a middle of the road. They can be super fine or they can be a little towards the more middle grade. Like I already said, the the Merinos, your shorter staple breeds like Southdown even, it's a little coarse, but it's a finer micron count. Like Lester long wool is a super soft wool. But again, it's a long wool. So there's so many things that go into that. um, But I really do think like Romney can be really soft. You can always blend your fibers too. So if you had like Romney with some Merino added in, that's going to be really soft. You can add your Pygora or Angora or um, Alpaca to Mm -hmm. your wool to, you know, soften it. If you have a coarser wool sheep for your, your heavier wools, then you're looking at your long wools for the most part. So your Lincoln, Border Lester's are kind of a medium. Um, That's a coarser wool. I would say like your finer wools are going to be your short to medium length and your longer wools are going to, I mean, your coarser wools are going to be the medium to long wools. Okay. That's really good. Yeah. To know that that's an easy way to, as people start thinking about what kind of sheep they want or what sheep they already have as to what kind of category that falls under. So so what I always say to people too is on that same thing is like the South Downs, baby doll South Downs are super popular mm-hmm. in the homesteading world because they're a smaller breed, but their, their fiber is very short. And if you want to spin it <clears throat> and you're not an accomplished spinner, it's going to be harder. Also, your mills can't spin it because it's so short. So oh. you have to make decisions like, can you wait two years to spin? I mean, to shear so that you're fiber is long enough. So that 
you know, there's a lot of little tricky nuances in there between what people love, what they love, what they see, but then what are they going to do with it? So, right. Yeah. You really need to get knowledge first. I always say to people like really investigate what you're grabbing before you bring the sheep home. Yeah. So sheep health, let's talk about about that for a second. When people are looking for their wool sheep, and they have made that decision what breed they want and what they want to do with it. What are some health things that they need to look for in those sheep when they go and buy them? Because one of the things that a lot of people hear all the time is that sheep are so fragile and they buy all these sheep and all the sheep die. So what is your recommendation for finding sheep and and good, healthy sheep? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So when I go to get some additional sheep for our flock, I want to see one, the first thing I notice is where are they being kept? Like when I go onto the property, where are they being kept? If they are not out on grass, I would like to know why. Are they being pulled off of grass for a reason? Is there, you know, a parasite load that I need to be aware of? Or are they just maybe there for, to give the the pasture a break? So there's lots of little things, first impressions. Mm -hmm. Everybody's barn should smell like a barn. I'm not saying that. But if the barn is wet or fly-ridden, I would really want to know why that was Mm -hmm. true. I'm not saying that when I look at somebody else's barn that I'm looking for pristine, like we could have a wedding here. I'm not looking at that. But I'm looking at basic cleanliness. Has the, the straw been kept up fairly recently? Is there piles of manure everywhere? What is the what's the poop look like? Is it Mm -hmm. normal? You know, the small little round pellets or is it globs? Uh, Because that can indicate there's some digestive problems going on. So those are my first blush looks. I want to look at their feet. Now, some breeds have very fast growing hooves. So, you know, I'm not making a total judgment Mm -hmm. call just on the condition of their feet, but I would like to get a look at their feet and see what's going on. Do they smell? Um, I certainly don't want to bring any hoof rot problems back to my own flock because that is so contagious, um, true hoof rot. Mm. Um, Sometimes it's just hoof scald that can be fixed by just conditions, you know, keeping them dry for a while and maybe some topical. Mm -hmm. I want to look at their eyes. I want to make sure there's no discharge, things like that. Like just basic animal health is what I'm looking for. One lady that I have acquired quite a few retired use from has always offered me their last fleece also so I can look at that in the bag and see the condition of it I can check to see if there's wool break it's a it's a great indicator I can look to see if there's any parasite damage on the fleece like from external parasites so I really appreciate that I don't really need the fleece but it's nice that she offers it to me because it's another step that proves to me that she's taking good care of her animals Mm -hmm. and then of course you can do the famacha scale by looking at their uh, lower eyelid, by pulling the eyelid down. It's a pretty quick test if you can get your hands around their neck long enough to <laughs> to grab them. Mm-hmm. Uh, some sheep are less conditioned to being handled. And, you know, so that's another thing, you know, you might not be able to get your hands on them until you get them in the trailer right. because, you know, some people use a chute. We don't use a chute. We um, put our animals into a smaller and smaller space to get them where I need them to work with them. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, depending on the difference in how they're being handled, you might not be able to just walk up and like grab them and be like, oh, I want to feel your right. fleece. You know, I want to pick up your hoof. I want to. So mm-hmm. some of these things you're going to have to um, ask for help with or ask for conditional sale, you know, where maybe you're going to exchange the money to a certain point, depending on your investment. I mean, $50 is probably not, right. you know, and most people that are selling their animals are willing to work with you as far as like, Hey, I would really like to see the bottom of her feet. You know, can we move her into a stall where we can get her mm-hmm. in a corner and one of us can pick up the hook? You know, so I, I would want that. I would want that back and forth um, agreeable, agreeable behavior to go on when I was choosing animals and definitely, you know, not any sickness, apparent sickness, no scours. Don't bring home an animal that scours. You don't know what you're bringing home at that point to your rest of your flock. Mm -hmm. 
So you mentioned hoof rot. Would could you tell people a little bit like what that looks like? What is it, and what does that look like with sheep? Mm-hmm. Well, it, when it gets advanced, it's actually quite debilitating for them. It's a softness in not only the bottom, but also up the sides. You can see some delamination starting mm-hmm. around the outer wall of the hoof. And it's very painful. When you look between the two toes or cloves, it, if you can rinse that out in there, it's actually a very, very strong red inflammation that you're dealing with. It's, it looks painful, uh, just to look at Mm. it. I have had it here, so we will always have it here. Uh, I don't want to bring any more Mm -hmm. strains or variations of it though. I can tell you that. Um, and keeping the conditions as dry as possible is a help for my sheep that are prone to having a resurgence of it. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, so let's go back to wool. You mentioned that, you know, the wool mill or spinning yourself, what's the process of going through? If, if people don't want to spin it themselves, um, I would venture to say that unless most people have are, are already spinning and then get into sheep, there's people like myself mm-hmm. who have sheep <laughs> and we don't spin yet. And right. so what is the process of going through a, a wool mill and how would somebody find one of those? Because right. I didn't even know you they existed until right. you mentioned it to me months back. Right, right. Um, yeah. And it's funny that people don't realize that this is an option. Um, it's mm-hmm. not always a cost effective option, depending on how you're raising your sheep. You know, there's in any business, you're going to look at your, um, I guess your break even point, right? Mm -hmm. With with sheep, a lot of times it's more animals in order to break even. So when you have a small flock like I do, I don't tend to look at the break even point because I'm sure it's not there. I'm just being honest. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I think my products sell well. Um, I can give you breakdowns, you know, from certain points on. But I don't mm-hmm. like we we uh, tend to over care about our animals, so they get a lot of, of babying, and so that that ends up being a little bit more costly. Uh, what I do is I just ask other sheep people in the area that are doing wool, you know, where do you get your where do you get your fleeces processed? Or you can do a Google search, you know, mm-hmm. fiber mills in Virginia. There are quite a few uh, fiber mills in Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. uh, fiber mills on the East Coast. Also, any of your breed associations, the fiber mills are probably members of your breed associations. And like here in Maryland, we have the Maryland Sheep Breeders Association. It's not just for Maryland residents. There are people from surrounding states that belong. And so we know the fiber mills that are members also. And so they're they're great okay. to talk to. I always talk to them at the festival every year, kind of get an idea of what they're processing because they'll have their products right there that they're processing. So you can feel it. You can see it. Mm-hmm. You can ask them what other things they can add to your product. Like maybe, you know, like like okay. I have some fleece that isn't always the softest. So I always ask them, like, do you have mm-hmm. the ability to add um, merino to my fleece? Because I want some merino top added in to make it softer. So I can get, you know, input right there from them. I think that it's a brilliant and beautiful idea that we often have as fiber producers that we're going to do the whole thing from raising the animal, you know, letting them lay them out on our properties. And it's just going to be this bucolic setting. Um, But when you get, say, 10 fleeces sheared in the spring and you put them in your garage Mm -hmm. or your basement and then... It's spring planting time and <laughs> the kids have, you know, the kids have activities right. and you're busy from the mor- moment you wake up until the moment you fall into bed. Mm-hmm. And then the fleeces are still sitting in your garage eight months later, a year later, and now it's time to shear again. And this happens not just to me, this happens to lots of people unless yeah. they are just devoted and dedicated to their wool process. You know, like Mm -hmm. I know some people that would never let that happen, but I also will guarantee they're probably not growing a big garden. They're probably not running a separate business in addition to their fiber animals. And they probably are just very, very focused on Mm -hmm. that part of life. So, you know, I have some, I know some brilliant shepherds who, you know, the minute those fleeces 
the shearer drives away and they're skirting their fleeces, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> How? You know, when our shearer leaves, I'm like looking for, you know, a glass of ice water and a couch. Like, I just want to go sit out. Like, I'm done. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. So. <laughs> yeah, we haven't gotten our sheep um, sheared yet because they were sheared uh, shortly before they came here. But it's about time for us to get them sheared. And so that's um that's an interesting process that I've not gone through yet. And so a lot of people are like, well, what are you going to do with it? And I'm like, I have no idea. It's probably going to sit in my basement until I know what to do with it. So I'm totally in that group of people, Janet. Well, and that's a good point, too, because you do have Lincolns. And Lincolns often mm-hmm. need to be sheared more than once a year because their wool gets too long. In addition, you know, like you've got, like I said, you've got your baby doll south down wool at one yeah. end. It's like this long. You've got your Lincoln long wool at the other end where some mills can't process it because it grew too long for their machinery. Mm-hmm. So then you are definitely going to be looking for a hand spinner if you don't spin yourself. Yeah. And luckily, we both know somebody who handles that really well. But, That's you know, right. I don't know if she's willing to take on even more. <laughs> for real. But um, the... You know, the the whole process, it's beautiful if you can say, I did this. Like, this is a lamb that grew up here, and I carted their, you know, skirted the wool, carted it, washed it, and spun it, and here's my yarn, and now I made you this hat. That is so amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, it gives me chills to even think about that happening. However, we know that that is not going to happen for very long or all the time. Now, at Mm -hmm. any one of those points, though, you could outsource If you want to do your spinning, you can outsource the washing and the carding and get back beautiful bats that you can then spin from. So, you know, you can, you can outsource the parts that you really don't want to do or don't mind having Mm. someone else do, and then, you know, bring it back in. I like the dyeing part, you know, that. And so I have everything done from, I do the skirting, I send it to the mill, I get it back as yarn, and I dye the yarn. And that's what mm-hmm. I sell. It's still my product, you know? It's right. not any less my product yeah. because because I chose mm-hmm. how to have it processed. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, our friend Casey was showing me some yarn that she had sent to the mill recently, and it came back beautiful. And so... Um, I'm always curious Mm -hmm. about those and how each person does it differently. And so the sheep we bought obviously came from her. And so it was interesting to see the wool that she got back from from those sheep when she shared them before they came here. Hey, thanks for listening. We're going to take a quick break to introduce you to one of our sponsors that has been with HOA for a few years, and that's Premier One Supplies. At Premier One, they've been providing electric fencing and electric netting, sheep and goat supplies, clippers and shears, ear tags, poultry products and expert advice for over 40 years. Whether it's electric netting for your chickens or cattle or horses or poultry or clippers and shears and even poultry supplies such as fencing, feeders, waterers, egg handling supplies, hatchery items, they have it all. They are a one-stop shop for all things homesteading, just like many of our sponsors. Check out Premier One Supplies at premieronesupplies.com. And don't forget to check them out at the HOA event this year. All right, so let's talk about, I recorded a podcast uh, last week, which is probably out by now, uh, about meat sheep but now there are dual purpose sheep and maybe even triple purpose sheep could you talk about that just a little bit like what are sheep good for obviously wool but expanding from there what else are they good for and maybe just a couple of breeds to go along with that i think in the in the homestead world any sheep that you have on your property in addition to wool is also a meat sheep Mm -hmm. no one who's breeding animals should not have the meat sheep element in their life. You can't, Mm -hmm. you can't keep them all right. (laughs) Nor should you, because they're not all going to exemplify the characteristics you want in the wool for that breed. So whether you're a registered breeder or not, you want to always be improving what you're producing. Not every lamb that is born on your property is going to have the characteristics that you want. So those are your meat sheep. Now, if you can't stomach that yourself and you're a breeder, 
then that's what the market is for. Mm -hmm. You take them off to market, you say bye-bye, and you let the market handle the sale for you. Yep. That is the only responsible way to breed animals as far as livestock yeah. goes. You cannot just continually breed and breed and breed the same animals without having this game plan. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you can do is sell the wool for other purposes. So instead of it being a fiber for clothing or home decor or whatever you're going to do in that uh, realm is sell it for garden uh, mulch and you're not going to get the same top dollar that you're going to get for processed yarn that's beautiful right. for you know making clothing but you are going to have a product that needs to have more recognition i am loving using waste wool mm -hmm. in my garden as far as a way to help it stay moister Mm -hmm. And it also adds so much great carbon nutrition back into the mm -hmm. soil as it decays. So that's another thing. And there's some shepherds that are doing a magnificent job now of making wool into pellets. I don't know the process. I am not up on this, but I am just clapping and applauding them for finding that other resource, that other way to use their wool. Yeah. And then, of course, there's milk. Any mammal that nurses its young is going to have milk. And mm -hmm. sheep dairy is amazing. Um, not only is it delicious, but it is nutritious. And the protein components are different than both cow and goat. So a lot of times people that are allergic to certain dairy or sensitive or just can't tolerate it can eat some sheep dairy products. So there's that. And then of course mm -hmm. the soap, you know, I always kind of say it's really kind of funny with goat milk soap or sheep milk soap because it uses so little milk. Yeah. But of course your sheep isn't going to be a milk producer like a cow. You know, you're not going to have eight gallons a day. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going right. to get a pint, a, you know, each milking maybe, you know, it's, it's good and it's fine. And I think that there are certain sheep breeds that are very productive but your regular sheep that you're probably mm -hmm. raising for wool is right. putting it's putting their nutrition into growing wool mm -hmm. that's just what they're bred for whereas your dairy breeds they're going to put their food energy into producing milk yeah so that's important to think about is what is your main your main reason for getting that breed mm -hmm. and you know kind of stick to that yeah. I mean, I, if I let my fins breed, which we don't breed here any longer, but if I did, you know, the, I could milk that you, but it still isn't going to be a great quantity of milk. It would just be, you know, right. just a kind of a fun little side. Yeah. To do. Something fun to keep you, just one more thing to keep you busy, right? <laughs> yeah. The, the Icelandic breed is known for being a more multi-purpose animal for both mm -hmm. meat fiber and milk so that's probably and the fins also fin breed also has a good reputation for being a multi-use sheep breed yeah yeah and we're going to unpackage dairy sheep in another podcast for those of you that are listening the podcast episode before this was talking specifically about meat sheep um, I wanted to talk to Janet about wool, which we're going to get more into in just a second. And then the next one after this will be about dairy. So you guys can kind of go back and listen to those episodes or wait for the next episode to come back if you want to come out, if you want to learn more. But you mentioned dyeing wool, Janet. So And you dye wool naturally. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, how you do that, what are some of the plants you use, and how others can get into that. Oh, sure. Well, you know, this is my hot topic, right? Um, I know. So I'll right? try, I try to be not uh, all, all over the place. But there's three sources that you can use for, for dyeing. I like to just kind of categorize them as three sources. You can forage for natural dyes. You can go out in your yard, in, in your woods, whatever you have available legally to go and forage. Um, lots of plants are out there that are actual dye plants as opposed to plants that might stain uh, staining and dyeing are two different things. Um, if mm -hmm. you fall down in the grass, you're going to get a grass stain. It's not going to stay significantly that color for long. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Whereas your natural dyes, they're actually a component 
of the plant and they have lasting color when applied correctly. So that's just a short answer on that. Good. The other one is your garden. You can garden certain plants and flowers that are beautiful dye plants. For instance, zinnias, uh, black-eyed Susans, sunflowers, hollyhocks, marigolds, popular one for yellow. And then the other source is your kitchen scraps. So much fun to use kitchen scraps in the winter when nothing's growing and it's maybe not that easy to go foraging. But if you're making bean soup out of black beans, there's a lot of color in those black beans. After you've soaked them, that water is your dye bath. So I always think that's an amazing one. Onion skins is another one. And your coffee and teas have so much tannin in them that they leave a good uh, natural dye too. So that's just some quick ones. Turmeric, if you have turmeric, Um, other things like that that you would probably normally just have is for cooking, but they can be used for other things. Your forage dyes that are super easy to find are goldenrod. There's some mints out there. We have a wild mint that grows on our property and it's prolific. It's everywhere. It's called Perilla. And I've used that for a green dye. Um, It it can be anywhere from a light green to a dark green, depending on how much of a little bit of iron that you add to it. You can make it really a dark forest green. Like here's one. Oh, wow. I know. It's amazing. So there's lots, lots of things like that. Pokeberry, you know, that is, that's a terrible one. It's everywhere, right? Uh-huh. Everyone, but it's useful. Likes, it's useful. <laughs> and not only that, it, it's a really good one to use as a solar dye experiment because um, heat, it's very sensitive to heat. So if you don't use any heat at all, it still works. It just takes yeah. longer. So that's fun. That's super cool. Who yeah. knew there was so much science behind oh, natural totally. dyes? I know. Well, it's a good thing I'd you paid. wrote a book all about it, right? <laughs> right. And I wish I'd paid attention a little bit better in biochemistry, but. <laughs> yeah. But that is such a cool skill, though, because you have to think like way back in the day, they weren't dyeing, you know, wool with right. synthetic dyes. They yeah. were using, they're doing exactly what you were doing. And that is right. such a. That's such yeah. a neat homestead skill to have. Yeah. And some of the plants are so um, are also so medicinal. Mm-hmm. Like there's a whole other facet of this that I haven't even reached yeah. of whether dyeing the yarn with medicinal dye plants gives you any benefits yeah. as far as like it being absorbed through your skin. I don't know much about this, so I'm not even going to go any further, but it's an avenue I would really like to explore because I love the interaction of plants and man Mm -hmm. and how, you know, we can do so much for our bodies by using herbal products. So that, that's a, a, a super fun thing. I mean, you've got tons of plants you can grow in your garden that will just look like a flower garden, Coreopsis, Mm -hmm. um, indigo, all your zinnias, marigolds, all those kind of uh, flowers. Woad is a another type of plant that kind of works like indigo. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just a kind of really short answer. It's a really long story. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you can do this in your own little small flower bed, and you can have plenty of flowers to save for dye. That's neat. And then, you know, of course, I just love going up in the woods in the fall and finding, you know, all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So, well, so you mentioned, golden yeah. Oh, goldenrod's my favorite to forage for. I love goldenrod just for medicinal reasons. But so you mentioned wearing wool and having some medicinal. Wondering, you know, the the connection with medicinal herb dyeing and. But is there is there any benefit to wearing wool in general? Like, is there is it more breathable or what are the benefits of of wearing wool? Um, it, it's it's. All of, all of those things. It is a health benefit because it's good for your skin because it's mm-hmm. a natural fiber. You know, we're, we've gotten accustomed in a very short amount of time to wearing plastic. Um, plastic is not good for us. Mm-hmm. It's not good to eat. It's not good to wear. It's, um, it's definitely not good for us when we dispose of it. You know, all of that. I call it mm-hmm. plastic clothing now because and I, I know that sounds kind of smarty, but It is. I mean, if you really break it down, that's what all your polyester clothing is. It's not a natural fiber. It's not naturally degrading back into the earth. Mm 
Whereas if you wear wool, and wool is very breathable, and the lightweight wools will keep you just as cool as a, you know, 50-50 t-shirt. 50-50 uh, meaning the mm-hmm. poly cotton blends that they have out. Right. So I've gotten like to be a really kind of snobby label reader. (laughs) And I'm really (laughs) glad that there's a lot of companies now uh, producing natural fiber clothing that is not off the Mm -hmm. charts expensive. In addition to wool, you can look for linen, 100% organic cotton. Uh, You know, I just always kind of like to leave the message that be aware of what you're putting on your body Mm -hmm. because it does matter. I think it really Mm -hmm. does matter. Yeah. When you think about all the little things that we do, like our clothing, what we eat, what our lotion, soap, chemicals, like all those little things over and over again, build up in your body. And so it makes sense that if you're not wearing a natural fiber, that that can be harmful to your body as well. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think your skin requires a certain amount of airflow and breathable Mm -hmm. coverage. And of course, that's what you're getting from wool. Um, I don't find it to be, I mean, if you're wearing a heavy wool, yeah, it's going to keep you warmer. I mean, but we're not talking about that. There are lightweight Mm -hmm. wools out there. Um, There are companies making wool t-shirts and they're from a very fine wool. So you know, I strongly suggest that people check them out, try them. You know, if you really don't like it, then that's your choice. Right. You know? <laughs> right. We do have choices. Right. But it's kind of my latest little thing is like, uh, what you know, sustainable clothing. Mm-hmm. Um, I've gotten involved in the local fiber shed group here in our area. And there's fiber shed groups all across the country. They started in California But there's a lot of knowledge there uh, as far as sustainable cloth Mm -hmm. and how to help make the right choices and not be promoting more and more plastic clothing, disposable clothing. That's awesome. It's just one more way homesteaders can get into wool production and live a natural life, right? Yeah. And that's actually one more point that I, um, I didn't bring up is you could sell your fleeces too. If you have certain breeds of fleece that are uh, in demand in the niche wool, wool market, you can sell them to to spinners. You can um, you know process them a little bit, like down to roving, and then mm-hmm. sell them at that point. And you know you can get some good return on your money if you don't want to fool with yarn at all. So yeah, you know that's that's another income producer for your sheep. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. All right. Well, anything that we haven't covered yet in regard to wool that you think we should add before we hop off here? Well, I just think that um, we need to really consider wool as the future Mm -hmm. and not just, uh, uh, you know, oh, that's what colonial people were. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) I think we really need to look at it as a very prominent player in the future of uh, clothing, cloth, regeneration, ag- you know, regenerative agriculture, you know, we, we have a silvo pasture farm. So a lot of our pastures are in the woods mm-hmm. and what the sheep have done for that ground, that earth that's, you know, in the trees is amazing. Uh, silvo pasture works for sheep. Yeah. I think the, the biggest fallacy out there is that you have to have rolling pastures for your sheep. You do not. Yeah. Yes. Sheep like to graze, but sheep also will browse low growing understory and they will make the whole farm and forest healthier for it. So this is kind of one of my Mm -hmm. subjects lately that I've been trying to explain to people because they are like, how do you raise sheep, you know, up there? How do you have, how do you have sheep up there? What are you letting them eat? You know, Mm -hmm. my sheep are round, like they're very well fed. (laughs) Well, we have, we found that to be true too. And, um, pretty much we started doing that when you started talking about it more because the, the first half of our property is just wide open pasture, um, which is great for the cow. Although cows like woods too, they like silver pasture as well, but the back half of the property is wooded to semi wooded. 
And we have been using those sheep to clean out spaces and add nutrients to the soil. Mm -hmm. And they love it. They are thriving on it. They are, like you said, they're, they're round, they're happy. The ruminants are full and they're just, you know, as if they were on pasture, maybe even more so like our sheep love the pasture, but they just, they really love the diversity of a silvo pasture yeah, setup. We do. So I think that's great. That's another topic we can dive into yes. another day. Yeah, I think that because that's a big one. That is a big one. And I think that animals will often self-medicate plants that they know mm-hmm. they need. So it will probably also prove yeah. in a lot of cases to be uh, natural parasite prevention to some extent if they have mm-hmm. access to things that you wouldn't normally see in a rolling field of green grass. Yep. And the other thing you can do if you don't have a lot of understory growth in your forest is bale graze. Um, take a bale of hay up wherever you're putting them for the day, spread it out. Not only are they going to be happy to have more room and be out in the forest, the seeds from the hay will naturally seed the area that is sparse. And we have found mm-hmm. that to be the best thing to do all winter is bale graze them on the worst pasture we have. So just, you know, walk out there with a bale or half a bale or whatever you need to feed them for the day and let them spread it. You know, it's amazing what'll come up underneath that leftover hay in the spring. Sheep are pretty incredible. We're, we're coming to find they have multiple uses and they're really like the ultimate homestead animal, especially for people who don't have hundreds of acres, you know, or, or even 10 or 15 acres. And so they're very easy to manage on a small property. Well, thanks for joining me, Janet. And we Uh only touched on topics, right? Like Janet has a whole book called keeping sheep and other fiber animals that you guys can go check out. We'll put all that information below. She has her natural dye book, which, you know, we could go over that for hours, which is really like a course, but you should just buy the book. There is (laughs) a course too. Okay. There is a course. Yeah, there is. Yeah. A, that's right. You have a course. So we'll put all of that information below um, because I know that you guys are going to want to learn more about wool, especially if you're getting into sheep. And I know you're going to have more questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And I'm sure Janet will be scouring the internet to answer some that you might have. Happy to. But anyhow, yeah. Thank you for joining us, Janet. I really enjoyed this episode. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Happy homesteading. Hey, thanks for taking the time to listen to this week's Homesteaders of America episode. We really enjoyed having you here. We welcome questions, and you can find the transcript and all the show notes below or on our Homesteaders of America blog post that we have up for this podcast episode. Don't forget to join us online with a membership or just to read blog posts and find out more information about our events at homesteadersofamerica.com. We also have a YouTube channel and follow us on all of our social media accounts to find out more about homesteading during this time in American history. All right, have a great day and happy homesteading. Mm -hmm.